Author Media presents Novel Marketing, the longest running book marketing podcast in the world. This is the show for writers who want to build their platform, sell more books, and change the world with writing worth talking about. I'm your host, Thomas Umstead Jr., and today we're going to answer a listener question. And if you'd like to ask a listener question yourself in a future episode, you can call 512-827-8377 or upload an audio file at novelmarketing.com. Now, we're about to get uh, to the listener question, but a quick reminder, the promo pricing for patrons to save 80% on the new How to Get Booked as a Podcast course ends in three days. So uh, if you're listening to this right after it posts, this is your last chance to save 80% on the course. And with that, let's roll the question. Hi, Thomas. This is Shauna. Um, I love listening to your podcast and I've learned really so much from it. Um, but my question today is about data analysis. After I gather statistics from my website traffic, social media, and, and sales, what do I do with that information? How do I convert it into practical steps that I can take to improve my platform and book sales? Thanks so much. I love this question uh, because it is so important and one that we haven't talked about. So thank you, Shauna, uh, so much for asking this. And uh, I'm, I can only assume that this is a follow-up question to episode 191, How to Track Your Marketing Efforts, which is, I think, a really foundational episode uh, to understand uh, the novel marketing approach to marketing. Tracking uh, and collecting information about what works and what not what doesn't work is so important. So if you haven't listened to that episode, I highly encourage you to go back and listen to episode 191. You can find it at novelmarketing.com slash 191. So why is this important? Why is collecting data important and why is using that data to make decisions important? Well, there's an old marketing saying that says, what gets measured gets managed. And part of the reason why authors often work so hard on social media is all of the feedback that they get from that activity, the likes and the comments and whatnot. And that feedback feels like measurement, but it isn't unless you're using that data to make uh, informed decisions, to use it to make better decisions. Usually it's just kind of a psychological boost. It's like, ooh, I got 100 likes on Instagram, I must be popular. Although, if your best friend is getting 200 likes on Instagram, you may not feel good about 100 likes on Instagram. There's always somebody getting more likes than you. A measurement, in many ways, is what separates marketing masters from marketing bozos. Uh, this is a Steve Jobs term, a bozo, somebody who doesn't know that they don't know what they're doing. And uh, part of the reason this podcast has been able to last so long, why it's the longest running podcast, is that we aren't married to just one approach. You know, the things that we were recommending back in 2013, we're not recommending all of those things anymore. We're constantly measuring. We're constantly looking at and seeing what works now. And if you're not measuring, it's very easy for your marketing to stop working and you don't know why or you don't know what has stopped working and you give up. You lose hope and you move on to the next thing. Uh, whereas if you measure, you are constantly learning, you're constantly getting better, and your marketing is continuing to get more effective. And if I could kind of explain the guiding principle of the novel marketing approach, uh, there's kind of two elements of it. And the first is that each author is different, and their marketing approach must be tailored to their specific uh, strengths and weaknesses. So, and I, I remember learning this the hard way. The first time I ga ever gave advice, uh, and somebody actually took it, <laughs> um, and it was when I was in college. I was overseeing a house full of college age guys, and uh, most of the guys went to the university that I went to. And I, at the time, I was very frustrated with my university's like strict attendance rules and how much they kind of mothered the students, because I was a very driven, responsible person, and I, I just kind of resented all of that and kind of wished I went to a, a bigger you know, state school where they treated the students more like adults and less like children. Well, one of the young men who lived with me uh, had, had just or moved into the house, and he was seeking advice on what you know college he should go to. And I was recommending to him that he go to the local community college because you know money was tight for him. They uh, treated their students more like adults, and the you know the faculty was equal quality. It's what I'd wished I had done more of. So I was kind of like giving him the advice I wish somebody had given me. And so he takes my advice. He registers for the community college, but then he 
doesn't go to class. <laughs> like he just never goes to class. And I was confounded. It was like, why would you not go to class? But he had come from a rough background and didn't have uh, the upbringing that I did. And he never had, he always had somebody making sure that he did what he was supposed to do. And if he didn't have that, he didn't do it. And so he ended up way f- failing out of all of his classes because he never went to class. And so what would have been good advice for me ended up being bad advice for him. And I learned, and and I felt really terrible because I'm like, I gave this guy the wrong advice. He should have gone to the university I was going to where they checked up on you and they called your parents if you didn't come to class and all of those things. Um, And yet I gave him the wrong advice. And I find the same is true for authors, that what works for one author may be terrible advice for the next author, which is why uh, getting to know an author specifically is important, but also measuring and seeing what works for you is important. Because just because some guru recommends a technique or you hear an author share an example of how they were able to use Facebook ads and it was so effective for them, doesn't mean Facebook ads are going to be effective for you. It might Facebook ads may unlock wealth and fortune for you, but it also may fail. And the only way to find what works for you specifically is by measuring. So uh, hopefully you can learn from my uh, my mistakes when it comes to uh, generic advice as opposed to specific advice. But I do want to go through a um, seven-step process of what to do in terms of measurement. So uh, I'm assuming that you've already listened to episode 191. <laughs> um, but if you haven't, uh, most of these steps won't be very useful. Uh, but step one is listen to episode 191 and start collecting data. Uh, You can't use data to make better marketing decisions uh, that you don't have, right? And often you can't collect data retroactively if you didn't collect it, right? You can't install Google Analytics a year ago and then have a year's worth of uh, traffic data on your website. If you haven't had Google Analytics on your website this whole time, that data is lost, right? You can't go back in time. Uh, So the very first step is to start collecting the data and try to collect as much data as you can, even if you don't know how you're going to use it, uh, because you, uh, you, you have to have it to use it. And uh, so start collecting it now. And we talk about lots of ways of tracking lots of things in episode 191. I I know this, this uh, first part of this episode is sounding a little bit like a commercial for episode 191. um, But it really does uh, stand on that episode's shoulders. So step one, start collecting data. Step two is to write out some questions, some marketing questions or some business questions that you're going to ask the data or that you're going to use the data to answer. And I feel like this is the step a lot of authors kind of... um, skip or or it's assumed by the gurus oh of course you know the author knows how to ask a good question and uh, that may not be the case or you may not know how many questions you can ask the data or that you can use the data to help you find answers to computers are really great at answering specific questions they are terrible at coming up with questions <laughs> so uh, this is where humans are really unique and and that we still are very curious and that is a defining characteristic that we have, I think, over the machines still. You can program a computer to ask questions, but I don't think you can program a computer to be curious. So here are some questions. This is not a comprehensive list, but hopefully it kind of gets the wheels turning in your head of of questions you can ask the data if you're collecting data on your marketing. Uh, So were sales up or down last month, right? This is the most fundamental question. Uh, and, And yet, if you're traditionally published, this is a question you don't have the data to answer. Easily. Although, again, if you listen to episode 181, we talk about techniques you can use. Even if you're, uh, sorry, if, if you're traditionally published, this is hard to answer. But in 191, we talk about ways, even if you're traditionally published, that you can find answers to this question. Uh, another question you could ask is Do my promotions on Facebook? boost book sales, right? This is a question that you can answer (laughs) and you can know the answer to. Uh, Do my ads on Facebook pay for themselves? A a different form of that same question. So I'd say promotions are the things that you're doing on Facebook for free. Ads are the things that you're paying money for to do on Facebook. And it may be your time on the promotions is wasted, but the time that you spend on ads is not wasted. And another thing as you're asking these questions, the question is not, did this boost sales? 
or well, that's part of the question. But another part of the question is how much did this boost sales? Because if one thing that you did and it took 10 hours and it boosted sales by 2%, and then another thing you did that took five hours and it boosted sales by 10%, do that second thing <laughs> because it has a better return on your time and your time is valuable. Often authors treat their time as being worthless and because um, they're like, well, I'm not paying myself. And that's a, a really terrible way to treat yourself, right? Uh, don't become your own slave. <laughs> your time is valuable and you need to pay yourself, at least in terms of your internal mental accounting. Um, and, and don't do drudgery uh, on your own behalf. You need to be doing things that are valuable, things that pay for themselves. And measurement is the way that you do that. Another question you can ask the data, uh, you know, do, pr do my promotions on Twitter boost book, book sales? And I won't go through every social network. I'll hopefully get the idea. Um, another interesting question is, does my website traffic correlate with book sales? So this is a question you may be able to uh, answer right now. If you've been tracking your traffic for the last year on with Google Analytics, you can pull up a graph of your website traffic for a year and you can pull up a, tra a graph of your book sales for a year and see if the peaks and valleys match at all. <laughs> you know, if they don't seem to have anything to do with each other, that tells you your website isn't a, uh, an effective part of your marketing or it's not a driving marketing as much as perhaps it could be. Uh, another question you could ask your data if you're collecting it is, are my followers mostly men or mostly women? A lot of people make assumptions to the answer of this question, and not just men and women, but also age groups. Uh, in fact, this is one of the things I looked at data for this show, and I was shocked of our Spotify listeners. So I don't get data on all of our listeners, but I do get data from Spotify. 90% of our listeners are women uh, to the Novel Marketing Podcast. I assumed that it was a majority uh, because uh, more women write books than men, but 90% kind of blew my mind. And so, uh, again, you have to look at the data to know. <laughs> and I, another thing I'd be very curious is how the Spotify listenership matches with the non-Spotify listenership, right? Are women more likely to use Spotify or not? I don't know the answer to that question yet, uh, but um, I could, you know, perhaps dig in, get some more data and, and find the answer to it. Uh, another question you could ask is what blog topics get the most attention, right? If you're a nonfiction writer and you're blogging and you're using blogging to drive uh, attention for your books and to test ideas potentially for the next book. This is a really key insight. If you're trying to figure out what to write your next book about, knowing which blog topics get the most attention is very key and, and very special because this isn't, you know, what topics are the most interesting in the world, right? These are what topics are the most interesting amongst the people that I already have permission to talk to, people who know who I am and come to my blog. Very useful for making decisions about which book to write next. And I will say, um, I, I surveyed patrons, and I think I'm going to send the same survey out to all listeners, but I, I surveyed the patrons asking them what course they wanted next. And it was not the course I thought they were going to want. <laughs> Everyone overwhelmingly uh, responded with a, with a one course idea that was way more popular than all of the others. And it was one that was way down on my priority list <laughs> in terms of like someday, may it was at the someday maybe level. And now I'm like, well, gosh, maybe I need to work on that course idea uh, next. So I, I don't want to tell you to skew the data if I, if I survey everyone. But um, you know, th this is why collecting data is really important because our understanding of the world is limited. And the older I get and the more I look at data, the more I realize how limited my understanding of the world is. Another question you can ask your data is, what is my sell-through rate? And this is a very useful metric and I'm realizing I'm throwing, away, throwing around some terms. I think we talked about sell-through rate in an, one of the definition episodes, but I'll, I'll define it quickly here. This is the number of people who bought book one who go on to buy book two, and you can calculate it for book three and on. And this is a really key metric, uh, especially for advertising, right? If 70% of people who buy book one go on to buy book two, uh, then you know, you know, if let's say book one is selling for $10 and book two is selling for $10, you're going to make $10 on book one and you're going to make another $7 on book two because there's a 70% chance each reader is going to buy book two. So you have, and let's say you only have two books in your series. I'm just doing this example to keep the math simple. You have a lifetime expected value of a reader of $17 which means you could potentially spend as much as $15, $16 on advertising per reader 
and still make a profit because you spend $15 to get somebody to buy your $10 book one, and then they go on and there's a 70% chance they're going to buy book two, which has a $7 expected value. You're making money in, in, in the long run. And of course, you have more books, that number goes up and your, your prices may be lower. There's lots of things that affect this. And again, this is why you have to measure for you. <laughs> you may not have a, a 70% sell route through it. I've seen books that have 90% sell through rate. Or 90% of the people who buy book one, they are sold. And I've also seen books that have like a 2% sell through rate. People are not finishing that first book. They're not enjoying it and they're not wanting to continue the story. Uh, so it really depends on the author. And it also really depends on the craft. Uh, are you able to thrill the audience that you're writing for? Another question you can ask data, did my book bub pay for itself? Or are my Amazon ads making money? And these are important questions to know the answer for, right? Is the money I'm investing, am I getting it back? Uh, how many additional books did my podcast interviews help sell last month, right? That's a question that you can answer from your data, especially if you're collecting it correctly. Um, although I will say podcast interviews are a little tricky to measure exactly uh, because uh, when somebody listens, uh, that listen is not a trackable event because of how podcasts work. And if they go to the bookstore and buy your book, um, you can't track it like you could with, say, an email or a Facebook promotion where you, there's a tracking code that's attached to the link that they click. Uh, although you can still um, get an idea, right? So if you were doing no promotions in September, and then in October you did four podcast interviews, you can compare your October sales to your September sales and use September as your benchmark. We'll talk about benchmarks here in a second. And, and you can get an idea, but it's not a perfect picture because other factors may have been influencing those sales up or down uh, that you don't have control over. Uh, but uh, again, some data is better than no data and just guessing. Um, <clears throat> oh, uh, one other thing about measuring the podcast. Podcasts have a long uh, tail. So think about when you're listening to this episode. This episode, you may be listening to it a week after it came out, two weeks after it came out. Some of you listening to it maybe a year or two in the future and you're binge listening uh, what are now old episodes. It's hard to imagine this episode now being an old episode, but in the future it will be. Uh, and so that's one of the kind of interesting things about podcasts uh, is that they sometimes take a while uh, to manifest. In fact, there's a really famous story of one of the first podcasts ever to sell ads. It's like the very first time a podcast sold ads in the very early days. It was a three-month trial and the company after three months couldn't show that they had any sales from their from sponsoring this podcast so they pulled their sponsorship but three months later they came back and they said you're our number one source of sales <laughs> so people were listening to the podcast and this is in the early days people like sunk synced uh sunk i'm not sure how you say their their ipods with their computers so it really did take a long time for people to listen to new podcast episodes when they came out. But they found that after over time, this podcast was incredibly influential, but it took time. It was also a, a more considered purchase. Uh, another question you can ask the, uh, the data, did that blog tour I just did uh, sell any books? And this is a question you absolutely can't answer. In fact, you can know exactly how many copies of your books a blog tour sold uh, directly anyway. Um, again, word of mouth, you can't measure, right? So if you do a blog tour and you sell 100 books verified, from the blog tour, but your book sales are up 150 over what you feel the benchmark is, it could be that some of those people from the blog tour went on and told their friends about your books. And there's a, a word of mouth amplifier, which is harder to measure. But you can still, again, with the benchmark, you can guess, oh, there's 50 books of sales I can't account for. Uh, potentially, there was a 50 book word of mouth factor. You just don't have as much certainty. Another question you can ask is, what is the lifetime value of a reader, right? You use this once you know your sell-through rate, right? The number of uh, book readers who buy book two and book three. You can add up all of those um, percentages against all of those books and the price of those books, and you can see how much a reader is worth. And then finally, how much of my revenue comes from ebook sales? Or how much of my revenue comes from audiobook sales? Um, all of these questions you can use data to answer. So, but you create the question first, 
whether or not you know how to answer it. And, and this is really important because you, you want to ask the question as a human. <laughs> it's very easy to start staring at spreadsheets and your eyes start watering and you don't know how to make sense of it. Uh, so I, I really encourage you to start with a question. Don't start with the data. I'm not saying don't look at charts and graphs. Sometimes you, looking at charts and graphs, things will jump out at you. Um, but you also, I would, they can still jump out at you when you've written some questions first. So I'd write some questions first. And then the next thing I would do, st all right, so that's step two, write some questions. Step one, start collecting data. So now let's talk about step three, keep a marketing journal. So analytics measures effects, right? The data me measures what happened. It doesn't necessarily capture what caused those things to happen. So, uh, right, there's nothing in your sales data that says, oh, I went on a podcast tour and I did 40 interviews this month. Uh, that's not going to be mentioned anywhere. And a year from now, you may have forgotten that you did a podcast tour. And this is why you keep a journal. You can do it on a monthly basis or just put what your major activities are that you're doing. Uh, right, so I started Facebook advertising on such and such date, and on a later date, I increased the amount of money I was spending, and then on this date, I tweaked my ads, right? You just, whatever you do, you just make an, a line item in your journal. It just be a simple bullet point on a list if you want. Uh, it doesn't have to be fancy. You could even keep it on pen and paper if you wanted, uh, but just keep a log of the activities that you're doing so that as you're looking at the data, you're like, well, gosh, sales went way up in December, uh, even more than the December before. What happened? Well, you look at your journal and you could see what you did or what you didn't do. <laughs> it's very, it's very telling. Um, you know, I have a fortnightly mastermind call and where we, at the beginning of each call, all the masterminds check in with how they're doing. And uh, what I started doing a year and a half ago is I started writing down ahead of time everything I was going to say in my check-in. And I've been keeping that as a log of all of my activities. It's turned out to be a really um, useful journal that I kind of create in real time. Uh, if you're using an editorial calendar for your content creation, you know, for your emails that you're sending out, uh, that can act as a journal as well, right? You go back and look at your editorial calendar and see what exactly you were doing in September of 2019 um, that caused the numbers to go up or down. Um, all right, so that's step three, keep a marketing journal. Step four is to create a dashboard. And, and this is arguably an, uh, a optional step. You can get answers from data without having a dashboard, but having dashboards make it easier for things to jump out at you from graphs and charts. Uh, so the first dashboard, and I imagine a lot of you use this already, it's book report. You can get it at getbookreport.com. Uh, a lot of people, some people look at book report and they're like, gosh, this isn't very useful. And I will say, if you only have one book for sale, it's not that useful. I mean, it is nice. It gives you some pretty graphs and charts. It turns the, the KDP reports into prettier reports. But where Get Re Book Report really shines is when you have multiple books and you're trying to kind of split out the data on a per book basis. That gets trickier. The KDB dashboard isn't great at that. It does it a little bit, but Book Report does it better. Uh, and then there's Cafe. I have a link to this, C-Y-F-E. There's a link in the show notes. And um, Dasheru. These are uh, analytics dashboards. And, and these are the two I'm recommending because these are the two that have decent free levels. Um, marketing dashboards can get incredibly expensive, like $1,000 a month, because uh, a lot of them are made for companies where that's a very reasonable expense. It doesn't make sense as an author to spend $1,000 a month for a marketing dashboard, but getting one for free might make sense. So uh, they, they bring in your Google Analytics data, like Cafe connects with Google Analytics, it connects with Facebook, it connects with Twitter, it connects with Instagram. You can get all of those reports all in one place. It even connects with um, QuickBooks if uh, online. So if you're using QuickBooks to track your money, you can pull in the financial reports and kind of put them all on one dashboard. I find that this is very helpful. Uh, finding good dashboards for a reasonable price, though, is tricky. In fact, as I was doing research on this for this episode, it almost made me want to start a uh, author marketing dashboard business. But I'm like, no, Thomas, you're pruning. This is the season of pruning, not the season of starting new businesses. So I, I, I slapped myself on the wrist and I kept doing research. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but there are some good ones. Cafe and Dasheru are, are worth checking out. All right, so that's step four, create a dashboard. Now let's talk about step five, set some benchmarks. 
um, you th this is what you're going to use to be able to know what normal is, right? What are typical sales? What's my typical traffic? What is my uh, typical engagement? So once you've done this first five steps, you're ready, right? You have your questions, you have your journal, you've created a dashboard, you've got those benchmarks and you have the data. The data came first. Uh, now it's time for the fun step. So it, step six, which is running experiments. This is where you try a new idea and you see if it makes a difference. So let's say you listen to a novel marketing podcast episode and we talk about some marketing technique and you're like, hey, that might work for me. And again, we give you a pantry on this show. I'm not expecting anyone to do everything we talk about, but there may be some technique we talk about on a future episode or an episode you've already listened to and you're like, I want to try that. I want to try doing guest interviews on podcasts and I want to see if it works. Well, your goal is uh, to run uh, to, or to beat your benchmarks, right? So you've got your benchmarks set. Let's say you know you normally sell $100 worth of eBooks a month then you do something new. Let's say you're running Amazon ads or you start guesting on podcasts and you want to see if you sell more than $100 worth of eBooks uh, in the month when those things happened. And, and one more note on podcasts, uh, make sure you measure in your journal when the podcast episode goes live. So you, you may record the episode in September, but if the episode doesn't air until November, uh, don't judge the podcast until the episode goes live. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going to get bad data, which is something I should have mentioned earlier. Any episode on data has got to have the most famous phrase about data, which is garbage in, garbage out. So if you start with bad data, you're going to get bad decisions. <laughs> so um, make sure you're measuring the right things. Now, when you're running experiments, these experiments can be new things that you're doing, but they can also be things that you were doing that you stopped doing, and you see if stopping doing those things has any impact. So what happens if I take the month of November off for NaNoWriMo and I don't do any Facebook, I don't do any Twitter, I'm completely dark on social media, does that affect my sales? And you may be surprised that taking the month off has no impact on sales whatsoever. And then you can with confidence know I can take that time I was spending on social media and write so many more books that's going to make me so much more money. Or maybe for you, social media is working and you see, wow, I took a 20% hit on social media and then you can make the decision is having one additional rough draft worth a 20 percent hit in engagement or sales or whatever it is that you're measuring uh, how much do my sales drop when i take a break from facebook ads for instance there's lots of uh, questions you can ask and you, this is when you kind of take the question and then you do an experiment to help find the answer to see what works for you specifically and then the final step, step seven, is you evaluate the experiments. So you, you've done your experiment, it's the end of November, you look at the data and you see what the impact was. Um, you can also uh, run retroactive experiments as you're evaluating experiments. So again, you look at your log and maybe you can kind of create a marketing journal in the past, kind of from your best memory, or you dig through your emails or, or something to figure out what you did in September. You see, oh, wow, sales are really down in September. Why? Or sales are really up in July. Why? And, and you'll get an idea. And, and I will say one more thing. If you're looking at the data on a monthly basis, there is seasonality. Uh, especially with certain genres. And so you need to have enough benchmark data. You're not just comparing a month to the previous month. You also want to compare that month's worth of sales to that same month last year. So, you know, you would expect December sales to go up if your book is the kind of book that people purchase as a Christmas present in December. So the fact that your sales went up in December doesn't necessarily mean that all that marketing you did in December worked. It may just be that Every, you know, the tide went up for everyone that month. So, again, you have to be kind of careful using data uh, that you're uh, using good data. So this is where you want to compare with the month before, but also compare to a year before. And, and the more you get into the data, the more you'll learn how to use it better. Uh, our episode today is brought to you by that new course I teased at the beginning, um, and I've been kind of referencing it throughout this episode, How to Get Booked as a Podcast Guest. Uh, podcast guesting is a really powerful technique that's used by 90% of USA Today bestselling authors. This is the technique the pros use, and it's one that you can start using right now. I, I think that the time to start... Um, 
learning how to guest on podcasts is perhaps a year before your first book comes out. The time to start pursuing guest interviews is about six to four months before your first book comes out because a lot of podcasts have really long lead times. Some podcasts, it's a six month lead time. So if you record your episode in January, it won't be until June that that episode airs. And so if your book is launching in June, you need to be reaching out to that podcaster in December to schedule the January interview so that it can air in June. And so this is something you want to start working on way ahead of time. Uh, it's not something you start working on two weeks before your book comes out. It can still help sell copies, but it won't sell copies for the launch. It'll sell copies six months from now uh, or, or two months from now or tomorrow, right? Some some podcasts have a really short lead time. I have a friend who does a twice a week podcast, and if he interviews you on Monday, that episode's going live on Thursday. But that's very uncommon. Um in fact, he's the only, of all the podcasters I know, he's the only one that has that short of a lead time. Uh, that's really scary. Most of us want a much uh, stronger safety net than that. Uh, but anyway, if you're a patron, you can save 80% on the course uh, for the next few days. And if you know, you're know you binging in the future, you can still fit, uh, um, save 50%. So it's still a much better price for patrons. And speaking of patrons, our patron today is Benjamin Ellefson, the author of The Land Without Color. Living in tropical Costa Rica, Benjamin loves writing whimsical adventures for children of all ages, and he's published three award-winning independent middle-grade novels focused on writing modern-day fairy tales that are fun for kids and thought-provoking for adults. So, Benjamin, thank you for being a patron of the Novel Marketing Podcast and for keeping us on the air. And if you would like information on how to become a patron, you can find it at novelmarketing.com. And uh, as for me, uh, when I'm recording this, again, I'm recording this several weeks before it goes live, but uh, this has been a rough week for my family. Uh, we've had two entirely different people die of two entirely different causes um, this week. And one was somebody who was completely unexpected and somebody who was before their time, <laughs> I guess the best way uh, to say it. And uh, we're all just kind of shocked uh, that she's not here anymore. She... she so anyway, uh, bear with me. <laughs> um, I, I realize when you hear this, it's going to be much later. But uh, if, if I was a little slow to get back to you uh, on you know patrons that are sending me questions or whatnot, um, we've all been a little rattled over here. So that's what's been going on uh, on the home front. Um, you have been listening to Thomas Umstadt Jr. on the Novel Marketing Podcast, giving you innovative ideas on how to use data to promote yourself online, offline, and everywhere in between. And if you would like to ask a question for a future episode, the number is 512-827-8377. Or uh, you can upload your audio on novelmarketing.com. Thanks for listening.